So we're what midway through your rookie season already? Yeah, I think we passed forty, a little past, like a little under fifty. Flying by. Sure. Okay. Sure. So, give me the quick assessment. How do you feel like you've done so far, and where you feel like you still have room for improvement? Um, you know, I feel like there's there's always going to be so much room for improvement, but just for the start. Uh, at the start, it was really just shocking. You know, you're in the NBA whenever you've been dreaming about this since you were a kid, and it's just trying to be able to carry yourself like a pro. Uh, on the court, off the court, it comes with a lot of different things, a lot of different mentalities, but just being able to just be surrounded by my teammates, the coaches, the staff, kind of helps me just fall into, figure out where, where I am and how do I have to act and carry myself. Uh, take me back to kind of those, those first days, you get drafted, <laughs> you get introduced mm -hmm. um you know what are your memories of those moments and just kind of the uh the, the culture shock i suppose it is i remember the first time when i not the first time well the first time i came here after i got drafted it was uh it was still like surreal and even to this day i still have like pinch me moments of just like is this reality mm -hmm. but just like walking in doing the photo shoot walking around seeing my locker with my name on it it was kind of not like a it wasn't a dream come true it was more just like all right my dream is just getting started, so let's just let the ball roll and let's see how far it goes. I do feel the need to ask because I feel like I ask this to a lot of athletes. Has it set in at all? No. I mean, for a lot of guys, it doesn't <laughs> even set in until they're long since retired. I mean, it's you just you're in, you go, and you don't really have time to kind of exactly. You really don't have time to like appreciate it, maybe. Yeah, because you don't have a second to like take a deep breath because it's so much going and going and going and going. Rapid. What has been the toughest adjustment? Travel. Travel and time management, honestly. Because hmm. you got to be able to, being, being on time is late and being early is on time. So you always just got to be able to make sure that you're on top, on top of your schedule, on top of time, and just being able to make sure that you just don't let time go away. You know, there's, a, there's definitely some times where I've almost been late. So that's the real heart attack, you know. <laughs> That, that hurts the pocket whenever you're late. But, you know, just being able to be in this position is just something I'm so grateful for. And the NBA is quite, a bit, quite an adjustment from college. <laughs> sure. The travel, all the games, mm -hmm. you go into the postseason, it's a lot. Sure. Are you doing anything to kind of manage that, making sure you're healthy for the, the full run as opposed to just kind of sprinting to the finish line? Um, I feel like there's a lot of components to that. You know, there's uh, off the court, I try to make sure that when I'm not doing basketball, mm -hmm. I focus on other things to take me away from basketball since I'm doing it so much. No matter if that's friends and family, enjoying just some simple time, just either going shopping, going to dinner, or just doing things with my family just kind of helps me realize why I'm doing this and why that I'm trying so hard to, you know, play basketball, I'm trying to make sure that I have generational wealth and I take care of everybody in my family. What does Derek Lively like to do off the court? What are the hobbies? What are the um, interests? That's a great question. Uh, I like to play video games. I like to just chill and really just relax. You know, there's, whenever you get a time to kick your feet up, you got to take advantage of it. No matter if that's putting on a TV show, playing video games, or just finding something else to, to do off the court. You know, there's sometimes, like I said, I love going to dinner because all I do is eat. But, you know, sometimes I like to walk around because you just go because I'm new to Dallas, mm -hmm. I like to just see the community. You know, the, whenever I'm walking around, you know, it's, sometimes I get, Derek, can I get a picture? But sometimes it's just someone giving me a fist bump and just saying, I appreciate you for what you're doing. I love your story and I love who you are. And, you know, just being able to just hear that when you're walking down the street kind of makes, you know, it makes the, whenever you walk a little bit lighter because it makes you just feel that much more better that what you're doing on the court is making an impact in somebody's life. Do you feel like you're having a positive experience exactly. in Dallas so far? I definitely do. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of, it's really easy to figure out if you're liked, if you're not liked, if you're having a good time or having a bad time. And I can definitely say I'm having an amazing time being in this position with the Dallas Mavericks. You know, I wouldn't trade this up for anything. So what's helped you adjust to becoming a pro? I mean, how have Luca and Kyrie and the rest of the team, mm -hmm. J-Kid management, whomever, kind of help kind of foster and develop you? Um, you know, in practice, in games, or walkthroughs, you could always just see them. If you're trying to figure something out, they can always tell. So they're always someone that you could go over and ask a question. If the defense does A, do I do B or do I do C? 
and then they're going to give me B, C, D, F, G. So there's just a lot of different things, a lot of different ways that I don't look at the game that they do. So just being able to hear how they view the game and understand it, it has helped me to get a lot better and it's helped me to be able to help the team a lot. Is it crazy like two years ago you were in high school watching these dudes playing the All-Star game and now you're catching lobs from them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and now uh, I'm sitting here joking with them, kicking it, enjoying time with them. You know, it's just uh, if you could tell me two years ago that I was going to be in the NBA playing for the Dallas Mavericks, I would have told you that's not a chance. But, you know, just the, every day I'm just grateful for being able to be in this position. You know, that I, <laughs> I have my friends, my family always hit, always talking to me about, you're really on the team with Luka and Kyrie. I'm like, yeah. I think that every day, but being able to know that both of them are great people, they're both goofballs, they're both just amazing people to be around, so I wouldn't trade it for the world. Kai, Kai is probably the most under control and most aware person that I know. Hmm. No matter what topic, no matter where we are, he's either listening, he's either paying attention, or he just knows what to say. And dialed what to say. in at all times. He's time. dialed in at all times. Okay. Luca is, Luca just enjoys every second of the day. No matter if he can make a joke, he can make someone smile, he's just gonna try to find a way to enjoy himself. You know, there's sometimes, sometimes he's gonna try to mess with you, sometimes he's gonna be hard on you, but at the end he's gonna smile. So that's how you know he's gonna have your back and he's enjoying it. When he first came into the league, we got the sense like, this is just a, a large adult boy. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. And he's still kind of. Oh yeah. Like that. I don't know if it's a European <laughs> thing or what. <laughs> You're definitely not wrong with that one. That's Luca too. Explains Luca to a T. <laughs> um, but, you know, he's become a dad now. Mm -hmm. um, how has that changed? Is he a bags under his eyes? Um, like, I'd be calling him an old man now because just ooh. by the way, like, you know, you could tell that sometimes he has to wake up in the middle of the night and he has to do something for, for, his, for his girl or his baby. But you could tell that when he comes back in, his... Uh, he got a little bit of bags under his eyes, or you can tell he's a little, a little drowsy. So it's always funny to just see him come in after you know he's had a long night. You, what, two years ago were senior yep. in high school. Um, kind of take me through this you know, journey the last couple of years. Um, do you feel like people were kind of sleeping on you in the, in the draft just because of what happened, you know, the, the injury at Duke? And so it's a long story, honestly. So senior year of high school, I come out of there being number one player in high school. Uh, midway through my season at Duke, I was known as the biggest number one bust that went to Duke because <laughs> I was hurt, I started to play, and people weren't, I wasn't producing things that everybody was expecting me to do. And That's, Duke fans are so rational, right? Exactly. They understand. They, they definitely gonna, they're either gonna praise you or pick you apart. So being able to know that for it was a good, a good amount of time that it didn't seem, it seemed like the world was against me. But, you know, that's kind of, that's not the first time me and my family has felt that way. So the only thing that we know how to do is put our head down, work, and do whatever you can to not prove them wrong, but just to quiet the haters a little bit. You know, they're always going to be there no matter what you do. So just being able to know that whatever I do and whatever my family does, is the best for our interest, not anyone else's. What's your escape? I keep saying my family, man. You know, I call aunts, uncles, cousins. I'll play video games with them. Yeah. Uh, I've had family come into town a couple of times. It really just being able to just sit back and enjoy time with people who I know have the best interest, my best interest in mind, is is very hard to find. You know, there's a lot of people out there that's gonna that's gonna either try to get close to you for a certain reason, yeah. trying to get something from you, or always asking for a handout. But I always know that my family has my back, and no matter if I was playing in the NBA or working at McDonald's, my family would act the same. So that's why I wouldn't trade them for anybody. Does your mom live here? My mom lives with me now. So She lives with you? She lives with me. She lives under my roof. Whoa, okay. So <laughs> honestly, this isn't the first time though. Whenever I was at Duke, I was fortunate enough to get her a new condo, well, a new apartment, not an apartment, a new house that we went from a townhouse to a house. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't able to live there because I was at Duke. Right. So my mom's living there. She's living under my roof, but I'm not there. So now, after going to a boarding school for four years, 
all of high school. After going to college for a year, my mom's finally living under the same roof as me. So the last time me and my mom lived under the same roof was five years ago. You know, it's kind of, she still she still tries to be a mother, but like I'm like mom, I don't still trying to treat you like you're 14. Exactly, yeah. but I'm 19, so it's just being able to just try to. We have moments where we're like, I'm good, ma. You know, you don't have to worry about me. I know how to handle myself, but you know, she's just doing her motherly duty. You catch? Do you feel like you're catching up on some lost time there? I mean, with it being yeah, um, oh yeah, you know, five years apart. That's a long time. Five years. So Those are like critical years where where she could where she could discipline me, ground me, do yeah. all that. But like now it's just hey, she maybe knows. It's a, maybe you're maybe you're onto something. Because that's like the stage of teenage years where exactly kids rebel and parents <laughs> are like are like, oh my god, Losing get this kid mind. to college. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So like there was a, I could definitely see where she's trying to like the little bird in the nest, but I've been out here flying for a while. So, you know, there's some times where we catch each other. We're like, all right, mom, like, I'm okay. You know, I know you're just being a mother, but I, I got things under control. You know, I'm an adult. I've been a pro. I'm trying to, yeah. trying to handle this out myself. I don't, I don't need you to help all the time, but no matter what I do, she always put her nose in it and try to help out. <laughs> <laughs> well, she comes to a bunch of games, right? Oh, definitely does. You can hear her. Um, I can't hear her, but I always know where she's sitting. Okay. And like me and my mom had this ability to just like talk without speaking. So like I could see it her I could see her at the other side of the stadium and I'll do a couple gestures and I know exactly what she's saying and she knows exactly what I'm saying. Own language. Mm -hmm. Um has it been nice to have her here as you kind of take this next step sure. of your of your story? She really just keeps she keeps everything that I truly wouldn't know how to handle she handles it, you know, coming when it comes to just like being able to just keep the house clean, being able to just cook food or because you're never going to get away from uh, mama's cooking. There's nothing better than that. And it's just being able to just have, I know that I got to handle my business on the court. She's going to handle everything at home so that I can just focus all that I can on basketball. So that's all the, that was the plan that she had whenever she came down here and it's been going pretty smooth. I think you did an interview leading into the NBA draft with ESPN, and you said that your mom's your superhero. For sure. I'm, I'm just curious. For sure. Why that is, and you know, because that's that's the ultimate word. That's what every mom wants to hear, right? That that their son thinks they're a superhero. So I think my mom's a superhero, really, because she's like, she's been through she's been through hell and back, and if you ask her, she'll just act like it was nothing. You know, there's been. The story is, whenever I was 10 years old, my mom got diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, and she has recently been in remission on August 9th, 2022. I got that tatted on my leg. But, so since she's basically from 10 years old to 18 years old, 18, 19 years old, she was battling cancer, and there was a lot of up and downs there was times where I didn't know she was going to make it. There was times where I didn't know if I had to go live with my aunt, go live with my uncles, or I didn't know where I was going to end up. I didn't know if I was going to be able to play basketball or what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. But no matter how low I've seen my mom be, no matter if she's throwing up in the middle of the night, no matter if she can't get up, no matter if she can barely speak throughout the day, no matter what she does, she's going to power through it. <laughs> No matter if there's some days where she, she can't even flip over in her bed, I know the next day she's going to try to push a little harder to try to fight through it. And that's what she does. She's stubborn as all get out, and you can't tell her, you can't tell her how to do something. She's going to figure out how to do it her way. You've been very open about this journey, mm -hmm. um, you know, because it's taken up almost half your really half your life, right? That's you know, sure. a lot of what you've known. Why do you feel able and comfortable to speak so openly about it? Has it always been that way or did it take time? You know, there was, a, there was definitely a point in my life where I was afraid to kind of tell people my story because I didn't know how they were going to view it. Hmm. I didn't know if they were going to make fun of me for it. I didn't know if they were going to view me as weak for it. But the older and older I grew, or, or the older and older I got, I realized that it's a part of my story because it's shaped me to who I am. Mm -hmm. It's caused me to grow up quick. It's caused me to become a man quicker. 
and it's caused me to just kind of put some of my child's years down so I could focus on taking care of my mom and focusing on the things that I need to do. You know, when I was a kid, there was some days where I had to go to CVS, pick up a prescription, drop it off with her, go to the corner store or go to Weiss and get food because she couldn't do it. So if she can't do it, somebody has to do it because we got to eat. So we were always going to just find a way to get through it. And whenever I was going through, whenever I went through high school, whenever I went through middle school, you know, I feel like there was always, there's always kids out there who are afraid to tell the harsh things that they've been through. Hmm. But that's not how you're supposed to view things because the harsh things that you've been through make you stronger in the end. Because whatever doesn't kill you really makes you stronger. So I definitely, I've seen a lot of people kind of hide behind the fact that they've been through traumatic things or they try to act like they never happened. But I really think you gotta be able to embrace those moments to show if I've been through this, I know the next thing that is hard in my life, I gotta power through to make me even stronger. So I feel like there's, especially these days, there's a lot of people who give up too early. Mm -hmm. Where you're supposed to, the longer the fight is, the more you're gonna get out of it in the end. You said you're very close with your family. Sure. And um, I remember seeing a couple of clips of them saying that you're, you have a lot of your dad's personality. <laughs> oh, yeah. What, what kind of stories have they told you in, in terms of, so why, why, why is that? So my dad, he was 6'7", 3'10". He was <laughs> loud as could be, big as could be. When he walks in the room, you're always going to notice he's always going to be the center of attention. And he's always walking with this big, goofy smile on his face. Mm -hmm. And I have the same face with the same smile. So... <laughs> No matter where I am with my family, it's always like no matter if I'm dancing, no matter if I'm just joking around, being loud, or just sitting there having a good time, they always just see a bit of my dad and me. So just being able to know that I have the same name, I got to carry his legacy farther than he could. It's like he's still there at the family get-togethers. Exactly. In a, in a way. You know, just being able to know that he was always Big Derek and I was Little Derek. And now I'm bigger than Big Derek was. So I'm Big Little D, that's what yeah. they call me. Biggest Derek. Exactly. Yeah, here you go. So, you know, uh, my dad is also kind of the, the start of the power journey because he passed away when I was seven, turning eight. This is before my mom, figured, before we knew my mom had cancer. So that was kind of the first hit that the world threw at us. And once we got through that, they threw another one right at us. And that one took a little bit longer with my mother. But since me and my family have been through those two things, we know that whatever is coming next, we got to get through that even more. Do you feel like, okay, world, give me your best? I mean, after, Honestly, after going, pushing through that and coming out the other side? That's what I felt like whenever I was looking at the draft. You know, there was some draft boards that put me as high as 22 and as low as the 40s. But, you know, I knew it was a gamble. I knew the only thing I could bet on was myself and my work ethic. So throughout the pre-draft process, I was in the gym working twice a day, doing whatever I could to either learn, hone my skills, or just focus in on just trying to become better. There was definitely times there where I, where I wanted to crack, where I wanted to quit, where I wanted to stop. But I always just kept thinking back to, I knew my mom ain't stop. I know she wasn't gonna give up even if it was gonna kill her. So just because this is annoying, it hurts, or my body doesn't feel right, I'm gonna keep pushing and see how far I get. But I never knew I was gonna climb this high. Was there ever a thought of going back to Duke for another year? Yes, of course that was in the back what, of my mind. What eventually kind of nudged you to the draft? Um, you know, I asked a couple of my friends who have made it to the league, and I asked them whenever they were going through the process, how do they know? And they said, you really don't know. It's a leap of faith. You know, you got to be able to either bet in yourself or you can be scared for it. And whenever I heard that, you know, it kind of just made me flash back to either being scared of what the world's going to put in front of you or let the world win. So I'm like, I ain't going to pick either of those answers. I'm going to just power through it. I'm going to figure out a way to get to the end. And I didn't expect this was going to be the finish line. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> Could you imagine a better fit? No, definitely no. I honestly, when throughout the whole draft process, I was gunning for this spot. I was because I knew this was the position that fit me the best. This was the role that I could do the best. So what I tried to do throughout my whole draft process was 
climb, climb, and climb. And no matter what anybody had to say about me, no matter what my old stats were, no matter what the old articles used to say, this is now, not then. So I'm gonna show you what I can do now. So let's hear these goals. What are you, what are you trying to accomplish? Rising Stars is, is coming up. Rising Stars is definitely coming up. Uh, maybe all, all rookie team trying to be on the defensive team, but I know that's not gonna happen. But that's a goal for the, for the career. And I want to win a championship. That's the truth. I want, to be, I want to bring a championship to the Dallas Mavericks. But no matter how many years that takes, it's always just going to be, if, if we fall short, that means we've got to push harder next year. Tyson Chandler. <sighs> Big man, TC. <laughs> so when you got drafted, mm -hmm. every Mavericks fan was thinking, we got yeah. Tyson 2.0. So, gee. Take me through those sessions. What has he helped kind of honestly, influence or develop in you? He's honestly like, a, like I look at him, we have tattoos in the same arm, tattoos <laughs> on the same leg. He's like, he's growing a beard, he has his ears pierced. I'm like, yeah, that's gonna be me whenever I'm 40. Like, that looks exactly how I would look when I'm 40 years old. So I'm like, all right, let me look at his tape, let me look at his film, let me look at, to see what he could do. And the more and more that I study him, the more and more I realize that I could emulate his game and take it even further. Mm -hmm. So the more and more I was with him, was working on my touch, was working on my timing, was working on my positioning, stance, just the little things that it's hard to teach somebody these things whenever you haven't played the position as a seven footer. But I'm finally getting coached by, coached and mentor, and mentored by someone who has been in my position who has excelled in my position and has won a chip. So it was really hard to say no to that. How can you not try to learn from someone who's been through it mm -hmm. and who's came out on top of it? So I could definitely say that everything that he said and everything that he's taught me, I've listened to and taken to heart. Yeah, and your head coach played with him. Exactly. I mean, that's like <laughs> so serendipitous. Lastly, I really want to ask you about kind of community involvement. You mentioned that you're still kind of learning the city and mm -hmm. getting adjusted. Um, what causes are important to you? Um, you know, do you have any goals, aspirations in terms of charity, foundations, give back on the horizon? That's something that you might want to do one day. Um, I definitely want to do something when it comes to like cancer research. I want to do something to find, uh, to help kids who are in like single parent homes hmm. or kids who are in like not the right space when it comes to their fam uh, family members doing drugs, family members being ill. I want to be able to find ways to either help families get into rehab, find treatment, or find ways to help. Uh, I've already been trying to help out with the homeless community here. No matter if that's going through my closet, going through whatever I don't wear, and sending it to the uh, local homeless shelter. And whenever I drive around in uh, my vehicle, I keep a, a bag of clothes, hmm. a bag of clothes I don't wear, and a case of water. So that I know whenever I come to a stoplight, and if I see someone on my left or my right, I always flag them down, make sure they get a t-shirt, a long sleeve, a sweatshirt, and a water. Whatever they need, I'm gonna just make sure I, I help a little bit. Because I know that a little bit goes a long way. Just because you throw something big at a problem doesn't mean the problem's gonna go away. You gotta slowly chip, at it, chip away at it until it slowly goes away. So those are probably my three biggest, uh, three, three biggest places that I wanna help give back but you know, that's just a start. I want to try to figure out to help endangered animals, to help climate change, a lot of different ways to just try to get back to either my community or get back to the planet. One final, final question. You're from Philly. Yep. Are you an Eagles fan? Yes. Oh, no. But you know, whenever oh, they, when no. the Eagles play the Cowboys, I'm an Eagles fan, but whenever the Cowboys play anybody else, I'll cheer for the Cowboys. So you know Jalen Brunson's a big Eagles fan, mm -hmm. and he and Luca, well, Luca's like an adopted Cowboys he got, fan. He's, an, he's a Cowboys yeah. fan. Yeah, so they would ha do these bets, mm -hmm. and they would have to wear the opposing team's jersey depending on who won. Have you done a bet with Luca yet? No, I haven't done a bet with Luca like that. You gotta get that second contract first before you do any bets Yeah, because I don't want to bet with him because he takes it too far every time. <laughs> I try to get a little wager going, and then I'm like, you know what, never mind. Yeah. I can't keep up with that. Adds a couple zeros. And, hey, exactly, because yeah. you know, rookies can't play that game. <laughs> <laughs> gotta get that Jordan, Jordan shoe first. Exactly. I got you, man. Well, thank you. Anything else you want to add just about whatever? Floor is yours if there's anything you wanted to plug or anything like that, uh, too. 
thank y'all for your time. And whoever's watching, just please don't give up no matter what you're going through, no matter if it's school, no matter if it's health, no matter if that's relationships, no matter if that's people in your family. Life's supposed to be hard. If it was easy, everybody would be great. To be great, you have to go through the hard things.